Salvete, and welcome back to Weekly Roman History. This week we're going to finish off the Roman monarchy. The Roman historian Livy is still our main source, with some help from the Greek historian Dionysius of Halicarnassus. There are no content warnings for this video. If you know the story, that might surprise you, but it's because I'm not going to cover the Lucretia story until the next video. Our first four kings were Romulus the founder, Numa Pompilius the peaceful religious king, Tullus Hostilius the warmonger, and Ancus Marcius the Goldilocks king. Now it's time to shake things up with the Etruscan kings. But what is an Etruscan anyway? Sidebar on Etruria. Is it too early in the video for a sidebar? Etruria, home of the Etruscans, is a region in the north of Italy. Today it is called Tuscany. Etruria was the dominant culture in Italy in the era just before the rise of Rome. The Etruscans are known in art history largely because of their true-to-life sculpture work, especially seen on the tops of their coffins. The Capitoline Wolf, that famous Romulus and Remus statue, is often thought to be an Etruscan bronze wolf with the babies added in the Renaissance. But Etruscan culture is more than just sculpture, and it had a tremendous influence on Roman culture. The Etruscans had a lot of contact with Greek culture, and much of the early Greek influence on Rome came through Etruria. Architecture, sewage systems, olives and grapes, and probably the twelve Olympian gods. Among the biggest influences, arches. The Greeks and Romans both loved columns, but the Etruscans were the ones to popularize topping their columns with arches, and the Romans took that on very famously. The Etruscans are also credited with giving Rome its favorite entertainments, gladiator fights and chariot races that were so fast they were often deadly. Etruria loved blood sports, and so did Rome. And probably their biggest influence was literacy. The Etruscan alphabet had been modified from the Greek alphabet, which itself had been modified from the Phoenician one. The Romans further modified the Etruscan alphabet to form their own, which has changed only a little bit to form the alphabet we now use in English. In short, the Etruscans were a powerful and culturally rich people to the north of Rome, and Rome would never have been Rome without them. Our story begins with an Etruscan immigrant named Lucamo. Lucamo lives in the Etruscan city of Tarquinii, and he is extremely wealthy because of what he inherited from his father, but he is not part of the aristocracy. His father was a Greek immigrant, making Lucamo persona non grata in politics. Lucamo's wife, Tanaquil, is the daughter of nobility, and she finds his lack of social influence intolerable. They decide to move to Rome, where social mobility is more possible for immigrants. The second king, after all, wasn't Roman. So Lucamo and Tanaquil are riding into Rome when all of a sudden an eagle swoops down from the sky and grabs the hat off of Lucamo's head. It flies into the air and then drops the hat right back down where it came from. Now Tanaquil is something of a prophet, and she sees this as a very good omen. Remember that the gods send signs through birds. The eagle is the bird of Jupiter, king of the gods, who has just metaphorically put a crown on Lucamo's head. Tanical says that her husband will be a king of Rome someday. This is probably a good place to remind you that we are still in the legendary part of Roman history, and this stuff didn't really happen the way the story goes. Lucamo gets to Rome and changes his name to the more Roman-sounding Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. His name is a little confused in the record. Lucamo is actually the Etruscan word for king, so that might have been a title, not a name. Priscus is Latin for ancient, early, old, and so was probably added to his name after the ascension of the second king Tarquinius, much as we only say Queen Elizabeth I after there's a Queen Elizabeth II. The middle name, Tarquinius, obviously came from the city in Etruria he immigrated from, and that's the name he is most known by, Tarquinius in Latin, Tarquin in English. Tarquinius Priscus, or Tarquin I, to distinguish him from the other Tarquin. Whatever his name, Tarquin starts to schmooze and rub elbows with the nobility. At this point, Rome has no problem with new money, and Tarquin becomes quite popular. He even gets to know King Ancus Marcius well enough that Ancus names him guardians of his sons in his will. After Ancus's death, his two sons, who are very young men, assume the throne will come to one of them. Their guardian, Tarquin, assures them that this is true, and sends them off on a hunting trip to forget their sorrows. While they're gone, he starts campaigning among the Senate and the people. According to Livy, he's the first king to actively lobby for the position, rather than just being chosen. Tarquin is voted in, and Ancus's sons come back to find themselves betrayed and usurped. Keep them in mind, because they'll be back. Among Tarquin's first acts is to add 100 senators, bringing the total number up to 300. The motivation here is obvious. He thinks his position as a foreigner who has lobbied his way onto the throne is a bit wobbly, and these new hundred men will be loyal to Tarquin because they owe him. Tarquin goes to war with the standard roll call of enemy neighbors from the monarchy period. The Sabines, the Latins, the Etruscans. There's no issue with this Etruscan king fighting other Etruscans, because Etruria, like Latium, is a loosely allied band of city-states without a lot of loyalty between each other. Through these wars, Tarquin gains territory, people, and money. Tarquin uses the spoils of war on huge building projects, grander than any king before him. He starts construction on the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, that is, Jupiter the best and greatest, on the Capitoline Hill. Though this is such a large project that 
that it lasts throughout the rest of the monarchy. He also builds the Circus Maximus, literally the very large racetrack, which was the biggest place for public games. Not only horse races, but also gladiator fights until the construction of the Colosseum over 500 years later. The fact that the first Etruscan king is given credit for building the Circus Maximus might have more to do with the fact that the Romans' favorite entertainments are Etruscan in origin than when the thing was actually built. Tarquin also gets credit for importing a lot of royal regalia from Etruria. Among the Etruscan markers of power are the triumphal parade, the scepter, the purple robe. Purple was an exceptionally difficult and expensive color to produce at the time. The purple bordered toga praetexta, the intentionally uncomfortable curule chair, and the fosces, which I will go into in a future video. Tarquin rules for 38 years and is quite popular. During his reign, something unusual happens in his palace. There's a young boy who lives in the house, some sources say the son of a slave, and some elaborate that this slave was formerly a Latin princess who was enslaved in war, though there is no agreement on this point. In any case, the boy is sleeping, and his head is on fire. The slaves are running about to get water to put it out, and making the kind of ruckus you might make when you're panicking because someone is on fire. But Tanaquil, the prophetess wife of Tarquin, says not so fast. His head is on fire, but he's sleeping peacefully. It's not burning or hurting him. This is no ordinary fire. It's a sign from the gods. The fire is a crown. This boy will become king. Do you notice Tanaquil's prophecies are kind of one note? The boy's name is Servius Tullius. Notice that Servius is close to Servus, slave, which should help you remember his origin story. Tanaquil takes on the boy as a protege, gets him married to her and Tarquin's daughter when he's of age, and shows him more favor than her and Tarquin's own sons. This is bound to make those sons jealous, but enrages someone else too. The sons of Ancus Marcius, who were passed over for the throne in favor of Tarquin. Apparently they've been hoping to take the throne after Tarquin dies, but Tanaquil is making her intentions with Servius Tullius obvious. So Ancus' sons decide it's time to assassinate Tarquin and take what should be theirs. The fact that they'd have to have been waiting 38 years for this moment is one reason this timeline is implausible, but we'll put that aside. They hire some assassins, and someone in this story has the unpleasant task of murdering an 80-year-old king with an axe to the head. Tarquin is assassinated inside the palace, but Tanaquil maintains control of the situation. She has him taken off to his bedroom, and though he dies quickly, he took an axe to the head, she tells the Roman people that he has been wounded in the attack and hopes to recover. So while he's incapacitated, she says, his wish is that his protege, Servius Tullius, act as regent. So Servius steps up as temporary king, and by the time Tanaquil announces that the king has died, it's easy to just make Servius' status permanent. Tanaquil is a clever lady. Ancus' sons see that they've been totally thwarted and run off into self-imposed exile before they can be accused. Servius's origins are shrouded in legends, and there are a lot of them. His mother might have been a Latin princess, or Servius might have been an Etruscan like Tar Tarquin and Tanaquil. One account even has him as the product of a virgin birth. It is common in the ancient world when a good ruler doesn't come from noble bloodline, when they spring up out of nowhere, so to speak, to give them an origin from the gods, or by divine intervention of some kind. Servius is another builder like Tarquin. He builds a great temple to Diana, the Greek Artemis, goddess of the hunt, which he gets the rest of the Latin peoples to contribute to, and attributes to the Latin League. The temple is designed to become a point of pilgrimage, and the fact that all the Latins built together is a way for Servius to establish Rome as the de facto capital of all the Latin lands. He is also given credit for the Servian Wall, a defensive wall encapsulating all seven hills, parts of which survive today. This attribution is false, as the wall is about 200 years too young to have been built in the monarchy. And it is said that Servius was the first to make coinage in Rome, which is also very unlikely to be true. The biggest thing Servius gets credit for is the first census. The census is not only about counting the people, but about assessing their wealth and resources for taxing and military purposes. For the first time under Servius, wealthier Romans pay higher shares of taxes and have higher ranks in the military because they can supply themselves with more gear. He separates Rome into five classes, from richest to poorest, and from then on conducts voting through those groups. This is a mixed move. It expands the vote to the lower classes rather than just the aristocracy, but the system by which the Romans vote still puts pretty much all the power in the hands of the upper classes. The tax burden on the poor is greatly lessened, but the rich make up for their loss of tax money in gains in power and status. Still, most sources paint Servius as a champion of the common people. He is an extremely popular ruler, a model king like Numa Pompilius, and Livy, among others, sees him as a sort of pioneer of the republic form of government that would come after the monarchy. And like Numa, 
Servius serves a literary role of providing a contrast with the wicked, tyrannical king who will come after him. Servius rules for 44 years before being brought down by our last king, Tarquinius Superbus. So Servius was no fool. He saw the first Tarquin's assassination, so he knows what happens when a king ignores the sons of the previous king who think the throne should be theirs. When Servius takes the throne, he attempts to appease the sons of Tarquin by marrying them to his own daughters. Tarquin has two sons, Lucius Jr. and Aruns. Lucius is ambitious and ruthless, and Aruns is calm and mild. Servius has two daughters, who because of Roman naming conventions are both named Tullia. Tullia Minor, the younger one, is ambitious and ruthless, and Tullia Maior, the older one, is calm and mild. And wouldn't you know it, because the marriages are chosen by age, they wind up married to the wrong ones. Each marriage has a nice spouse and an evil spouse. But the function of these marriages is to keep the Tarquins in the royal family, which means that all four Tarquins and Tulliae have constant contact with each other. Lucius Tarquinius and Tullia Minor fall in love, and they hatch a two-part plan. Part 1 murder their own spouses so they can marry each other, which they do. Part 2. Take the throne for Tarquin. This one takes longer. The fact that it takes 44 years is another place we have to stretch our disbelief about this timeline. Some Roman historians take care of the problem by suggesting that the second Tarquin was actually the first Tarquin's grandson, not his son. But the predominant story always has him as his son. Once Tarquin is sure that he has the support of a majority of the Senate, he takes the brazen move of coming to the Senate House in a purple robe and taking the king's chair there. Then he gives a speech criticizing Servius, no doubt repeating the points he made while gaining the Senate's support. Servius is the son of a slave, he was not freely elected, but gifted the throne by a woman, he favors the lower classes over the wealthy. Servius hears this is happening and runs into the Senate House, and Tarquin doesn't back down. He says this is his father's chair, and kicks the elderly Servius down the Senate steps. Men loyal to him then murder Servius, and Tarquin is elected king. Tullia is supposedly the first one to hail him as a king, but then Tarquin sends her home because he's afraid there might be more violence. On her way home in her chariot, she sees Servius' body still lying in the street and instructs her driver to run over him. This is, of course, her father. The street where this occurred is afterward known as the Weakus Sceleratus, or the Wicked Street. Sidebar on Roman women. You might have noticed that both of the prominent female characters in this story are scheming, manipulative, and eager to work outside the rules to get what they want. This is no coincidence. It's a reflection of Roman anxieties about women in public life. In ancient Roman belief, the ideal woman is quiet, submissive, and stays in the home. A woman who becomes famous, according to Roman thought, probably has something wrong with her, because a good woman does not desire notoriety. Keep this in mind when female characters come up. Since the authors of the story were men who didn't think women ought to have any ambition beyond being a good wife to her husband, any woman who doesn't fit this mold, whether she's real or fictional, will be looked down upon in the text. Such depictions of women reflect the worldviews of male Roman authors, not necessarily the real lived experiences of Roman women. Okay, back to Tarquin. The second Tarquin's first act is to refuse a burial to Servius Tullius. This is not only a huge insult, but also a sin against the gods. Tarquin mockingly offers that the first king, Romulus, didn't get a burial either. This act of cruelty earns him the nickname Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud. But think of proud in its negative sense, prideful, arrogant. Tarquinius Superbus is the name that goes down in history. Next, he executes a bunch of senators that he thinks were loyal to Servius, rendering the Senate weak and fearful of opposing him. He gives himself discretion over the death penalty, making it easy for him to have anyone executed on trumped-up charges. Because the property of anyone executed by the state goes to the state, Tarquin is able to enrich himself greatly on the confiscated property of those he executes. That's his domestic policy. On the war front, Tarquin succeeds as much by subterfuge as by open war. He convenes a meeting of the leaders of the Latin tribes and then doesn't show up. A chief named Turnus Herdonius, note that he has the same name as Aeneas's Rutulian enemy, gets up and gives a speech about Tarquin's arrogance and tyranny. When Tarquin hears about it, he has a ton of weapons hidden in Turnus's hotel room and accuses him of plotting to gain power by assassinating Tarquin and the Latin leaders. Turnus is executed by drowning, and all the other leaders get a lesson in what happens if you go against Tarquin. Tarquin sends his son Sextus Tarquinius to infiltrate the Latin city of Gabii. Sextus pretends that his tyrannical father has turned on his family members, which is a plausible story because Tarquin's character is well known. He becomes a trusted war leader among the Gabini, and sends a messenger to ask his father what to do next. 
Tarquin says nothing to the messenger, just goes to a patch of poppy flowers in his garden, and uses his walking stick to knock the heads off all the tallest poppies. The messenger relays this to Sextus, and Sextus understands perfectly. Take out the heads of the Gabini. One by one, he has the leaders of Gabii accused and executed, until the people are in his hands, and he can hand them over to Rome. Through underhanded means like these, and also through traditional warfare, Tarquin enlarges and enriches Rome. He uses the spoils on building projects. He excavates the Cloaca Maxima, which is the giant sewer underneath Rome. That might not seem glorious to you, but it was an engineering marvel of the ancient world, and the fact that its sewage ran underground made Rome an exceptionally sanitary city. Tarquin also continues work on the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, started by the first Tarquin, which is a massive undertaking requiring a lot of money and a lot of labor. Tarquin presses Roman citizens into working on this temple, much in the same way he drafts them for wars, and it breeds resentment among the citizens, who feel like Tarquin's slaves. While Tarquinius Superbus is on the throne, a famous prophetess comes to Rome. The Cumaean Sibyl, a well-respected soothsayer from Cumae, south of Rome, comes to Tarquin and offers him nine books of prophecy. But she's selling them, not giving them away, and her price is too high. Tarquin refuses. So the Sibyl leaves, burns three of the books, and comes back to offer him six books at the same price. Tarquin hesitates. She's the best prophet in Italy, and it's an attention-grabbing bargaining method. But he refuses again. The Sibyl leaves and burns three more books, and the augurs urge Tarquin not to let her destroy any more. So Tarquin buys the three remaining books at the same price he could have bought nine. These are called the Sibylline Books, which are stored in a locked room under the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, and consulted in times of crisis. Not exactly as prophecy of what will happen, but more as a way of figuring out what ceremonies and offerings are needed after a catastrophe, or to ward one off if bad omens have been seen. The temple burned in 83 BCE, and the books were lost. I'm going to save the story of Tarquin's removal for the next video, because it's wrapped up in the beginning of the Republic. For now, suffice to say that Tarquin's autocratic tendencies, his taking of the throne by force, and his foreignness all breed resentment in the Roman people that result not only in his removal after 25 years, but in the removal of kings entirely. Tarquinius Superbus is the last and the worst Roman king. This era of Etruscan kings is an interesting one in legendary Roman history. There's a strong possibility that the last three kings were based on real rulers. The fact that they were foreign especially seems to be a thing that the Romans wouldn't have made up if there weren't a kernel of truth to it. It's possible that there was an Etruscan city that briefly conquered Rome before being thrown back off, and the story that Rome was ruled by immigrant kings but continued as an independent state was a face-saving fiction. The concept is clear that at least the last foreign king was so hated that the Romans just had to get rid of him and regain self-government, which would support the idea of a foreign invasion and colonial government. We'll never know for sure, but the era of foreign rule is a prerequisite to the subject of next week's video, the foundation of the Roman Republic. The revolution begins next.